All right, let's see who all are here. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Perfect, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, people, so we have Jonathan lives with us today and he's going to talk about APM 2.0 for game testing. If you're a fan of games, I think this is a very interesting workshop. Uh, without wasting more time, Jonathan, I would uh, you know, you're on stage, you're already here, uh, but the stage is yours now. And if you need anything, I'm here. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Lali. Um, yes. Hello, everybody. Um, unfortunately, I can't see you because I'm just looking at my uh, PowerPoint presentation here. Um, but I'm very excited to be um, presenting and running through this workshop. Something that's pretty new to me. This is the first time I'm giving a workshop like this. So it's uh, very exciting. Hopefully it won't be too exciting in terms of things uh, going wrong for us as we try and move along in it together, but uh, hopefully it will be exciting in a good way. So um, yeah, this workshop is about Appium 2 for game testing. There's a couple main takeaways that I want just to talk about before we begin. Um, one is that, yes, I think it is becoming more possible to use Appium for testing games. That wasn't always true. Uh, but more broadly, I want you to take away the idea that with Appium 2, we can have lots of things like this that get added to the Appium ecosystem uh, by anybody. It doesn't have to be a member of the Appium team. Uh, you know, you can create your own plugins for Appium that add significant new features uh, significant new types of testing without necessarily having to go through a process of becoming an Appium contributor, things like that. So that's one of the, the things that I'm really trying to do with this workshop um, and kind of creating a, a plugin for Appium to help test games is kind of an example of this larger um, perspective that I'm trying to promote. But this workshop is about, you know, how can we use Appium to automate games, specifically Unity games, um, because that's the technology that this automation stack works with. Um, so if your game isn't a Unity game, uh, this workshop is not going to be helpful, but uh, a lot of games are Unity games. So um, just a word about myself, in case uh, this is the first time that we're encountering each other. Um, I have been the Appium uh, kind of lead maintainer or kind of project coordinator developer for uh, since the beginning. So, um, you know, I think it's now over, uh, I guess it's now about over nine years of Appium and it's been a fun journey. I currently work for a company called Headspin, which is a, a user experience testing uh, cloud that is fully uh, Appium compatible. And um, yeah, I think that's enough about me. So let's go on. We're gonna have a few slides to begin and then we'll go into the hands-on portion. So the, the problem that you know this, this tool I've developed is trying to address is that um, it's been difficult so far to automate games with Appium. That's because the standard Appium drivers that you're familiar with, if you've used Appium, um, are designed primarily to work with standard user interface elements, um, the things that most applications used that allow user interaction and, and presentation of information. Um, this is very different from games. Uh, games are usually based around art assets, which are rendered in, in two or three dimensions. Um, and to the standard UI automation tools like XCUI test or UI Automator 2, for example, um, they just show up as kind of a single box on the screen. You can't see anything inside of them because they don't have any standard UI components. Another problem with automating games is that typically uh, timing is a much more important aspect of interacting with the game than with uh, an app. You know, if I've got an app on my phone that's asking me to, you know, check into a flight, which I just did a minute ago, um, I might have some time constraints, like I might have to complete the session within 10 minutes, but uh, usually I don't have to hit precise buttons at precise times in order to be successful. Um, but that is often what you have to do with, with games. So speed is a very, very big 
issue in game automation um, that's not quite so big in UI automation. And this is also a problem for Appium because up until now, if you wanted to do game automation with Appium, uh, you basically needed to use image-based automation. So like finding a template image and sending it to Appium and saying, you know, tap on whatever part of the screen looks like this template image. And that works okay for some games, but it is uh, unfortunately pretty brittle um, because it can't handle dynamic game situations that you might not have been able to take a screenshot of yet. And it's also slow because we have to go through this whole image analysis anytime you want to do anything. And that um, kind of rules out automating, um, you know, fast paced games, especially. So, uh, you know, take a game like this. This is actually a screen from the game that we're going to be automating today. It's just a, a kind of a sample game or a template game that's included with the um, Unity game environment. And, uh, you know, it has this little character that you can run around and it's, a, it's kind of what we call a platformer, meaning that you kind of jump from platform to platform and try not to run into things. Um, sort of like, you know, Mario Brothers or one of those old school games. So you can imagine a game like this. Um, we've got the player, we've got this red blob, which is one of the like enemies of the player. And you want to be able to test something like, you know, running the player, causing the players, this little character to jump, and then um, landing right on top of this red blob, and then saying, okay, well, did the, did the enemy die or fall off the screen or whatever? So um, this is going to be pretty hard to do with image-based automation for the reasons we just mentioned. Um, but thankfully, there is uh, now a better way to do some of these things. Um, but first, let's talk about Unity itself. So I mentioned this already, but Unity is a, a game development platform for all kinds of games. And um, it can actually build games in a cross-platform fashion. I'm not a game developer. I really don't know anything about Unity beyond what I've needed to learn to go through this process. So I could be wrong about how easy it is. Um, but in general, it seems like if you can kind of make your game work in Unity, then it's you can publish it to all of these different platforms um, pretty easily, which is a very cool thing. Um, and it seems like a ton of games are built with Unity. I, I know that there are many that are not, but it seems like it's quite popular, maybe even the most popular um, game development platform, especially for games that involve 3D and things like that. I could be wrong about that, but um, it seems like a, a very popular choice. Um, which is why it is, I think, a great candidate to get some extra automation attention. And um, that's exactly what has happened. Uh, there's a, a team, uh, well, here's the, <clears throat> excuse me, here's the link to the Unity website. Uh, there's a team called uh, Altum. Uh, I forget where they're based. It might be like Sweden, Finland. Uh, I, should, I should know. Anyway, um, they've developed a really interesting solution for basically instrumenting a Unity game, meaning adding a, a kind of package to a Unity game that enables that game uh, to be automated. Um, it's called Alt Unity Tester. And um, the portion of it that we use, uh, that we're going to be involved with, is actually free and open source. It's hosted on, on GitLab. And it's a Unity asset. And as far as I can tell, an asset when it comes to Unity games is just kind of like a package or a module that you can um, kind of sprinkle into your game that brings in code or uh, 3D models, or it sounds like it, you know, scripts can bring in all kinds of different things. Um, and then it gets compiled with your uh, game. Um, so this alt unity tester asset can be imported into your unity game and you can use um, the asset to build a test version of the game that includes uh, a special server process inside of it. Um, and then the other half of alt unity tester is a set of clients that can speak to this special server process. Um, they have written clients in C sharp and Python. And the purpose of these clients is to be able 
it is to enable us to kind of send commands into the game from the outside. Uh, and because their Unity asset is running within the game, um, but it exposes um, a, a connections to the outside world, we can actually sort of remote control the game. Um, and that's pretty cool. Obviously, it only works for Unity games because that's what this um, solution is specifically designed for. But uh, it does work pretty well with them. And actually, people have been using Alt Unity Tester for a while. It's not particularly new. Um, in fact, it was demonstrated at the very first Appium conference, which was, uh, I think, maybe four years ago, um, three and a half or four, maybe more years ago. And um, so people have been using Alt Unity Tester and Appium together for a while. And that's because Alt Unity Tester and Appium actually make a pretty great team because, uh, like we've just been talking about, Alt Unity Tester can do things that Appium can't, like make things happen inside of Unity games. But Appium can do things that Alt Unity Tester can't because Alt Unity Tester is running from within uh, the, the game. It can't do device level things. Um, so actually, in a typical automation scenario, people would use both Appium and Alt Unity Tester to, to get things done. Um, so they're certainly um, compatible. They just didn't really have any special kind of integration. If you wanted to use them both, you just used them both side by side. You, you know, created clients for both of them um, and you just were, were responsible for using them independently within the same test cases. And that's fine. Um, uh, here's the, the link to Alt, Alt Unity Tester. I'm going to put these slides up um, on the repo for this workshop. So don't feel like you need to screenshot everything if you don't, don't want to. Um, but yeah, this is where the Alt Unity Tester code is hosted. Uh, anyway, I, I got to thinking that it would be pretty cool if there could be a, a tighter integration between these two technologies. And so I created something that I'm calling the Appium Alt Unity plugin. And I developed it in my work at Headspin um, as a way to basically provide automation capabilities for Unity games from within Appium itself. So it kind of creates a, a much tighter integration between Appium and Alt Unity Tester so that as an Appium user, you don't even you know, really need to know anything about Alt Unity Tester. Uh, it certainly helps, just like it always helps to know something about the tools that are underneath the, the kind of front-end tools that you're using. But um, it basically lets you live entirely within the Appium paradigm. So what it is, is it's an Appium 2.0 plugin. And if you don't know anything about Appium 2.0 plugins, I'd recommend checking out some of my um, recent talks. I've given a number of recent talks, which you can find online, that talk about Appium plugins and what they are and what they can do. Uh, this particular plugin basically has implemented its own Alt Unity tester client. Um, I had to implement a new one because one didn't exist in, in JavaScript yet. So I actually wrote an Alt Unity tester client in TypeScript, um, which is kind of part of this Appium 2.0 plugin. Um, and it basically just uses that new client uh, behind the scenes when you run your regular Appium commands in order to give you access to capabilities from within the Unity game. So basically, you can use only the uh, Appium, you know, create session commands and find element commands and element interaction commands uh, to automate your Unity game. You don't actually have to import the Alt Unity tester client or use its API in your test code. You can stick to just doing Appium. Um, I think I mentioned this already, but it's important to realize that the Appium plugin isn't exactly a one-stop shop. It kind of can't be um, because there's some application setup that's required to use this whole stack. Somebody has to actually add the Alt Unity Tester asset into the Unity game. So the Appium plugin won't do that for you. Um, it just means that you don't have to worry about kind of using Alt Unity Tester and its API as a separate um, piece in your test writing paradigm. But somebody still has to get the Alt Unity Tester server um, instrumented into your game. And we're going to do that together as part of the workshop. 
And uh, the plugin is pretty easy to install. Um, you just use the Appium plugin install command, which we'll do uh, live here in a little bit. Here is the uh, link for the Appium Alt Unity plugin. This is probably the most important um, reference to have open during the workshop or just as you're playing around with the plugin because it's kind of the complete set of documentation for the plugin that I've developed. And I'm happy to say that at least as of this moment, um, it is very complete documentation. And uh, so anything you can do with the plugin is documented there and there's setup steps and everything. Things you can do with the plugin, we'll encounter some of these within the workshop, kind of what you'd expect. Basically the, the plugin um, exposes a new context that you can switch into when you want to target the Unity stuff and not you know, the Android stuff or the iOS stuff or whatever platform the game is actually running on. You can find and interact with elements. Um, you can even do some kind of Unity specific things that aren't you know, related to the, the platform the game is running on. But within Unity games, uh, you know, this is what I've learned since looking into this project, but Unity uh, objects, like the game objects, like, a, like the player object or a, a token or whatever, um, can have any number of components on them. And these components can basically add all kinds of behavior functionality onto the game objects. And these components consist of all kinds of properties. Like you might have a component that manages the, uh, the, the health points of, uh, of a character, or you might have a component that manages the collision box for a sprite so that you know when it bumps into something and needs to stop moving. Um, so all of these um, components have properties that um, enable them to work. So you can actually retrieve and set these properties on the various game objects. So you can use this plugin um, to do some pretty deep stuff inside of your game. You can, you know, for example, if your game character, uh, well, let's say dies when it reaches zero hit points, you could write a test that just, uh, you know, takes the, the player's hit points down to one so that it's much easier for them to, to you know, be killed by an enemy and makes your test faster. Um, just a random example I came up with on the fly of how you can use this very powerful set of commands. Uh, we won't really look into that on the workshop. It's a little bit more advanced and very, very game dependent. So uh, not uh, the most transferable, but it's something to look into in terms of which components and which properties you have available within the games that you're automating. You can trigger key events so that you can you know, emulate a user pressing the controls to drive the game. You can uh, launch specific scenes within the game. These are kind of like Android activities, I would say. If uh, you're kind of coming from Appia mobile development, you can go directly to a particular scene and, and load it up. You can change the speed of the game. Uh, and there's probably more things um, that will be coming soon. Um, I, don't, I haven't been able to implement the, the full set of possible Alt Unity Tester commands, um, and I'm still kind of learning as we go here as well. Uh, so that is basically what you can do with the plugin. So let's move on from slides and start to do some stuff in a hands-on way. I'll say right from the outset that, uh, where have we got here? This is what I want to show you that, um, because we're not, you know, sitting in the same room together and because you know, there's, I don't know how many of you there are, we can't really do any hands on troubleshooting. So I'm going to be going through the steps myself. Uh, if you run into problems, I've, I've tried to write about some potential problems um, in the workshop uh, guide or handbook, which um, is all open source on my GitHub profile at jlip slash unity dash plugin dash workshop. So I'm actually just going to be following along with these instructions that I've already written down in order to drive this workshop. So if you fall behind or want a reference later on, um, you know, by all means, this is a great reference for you to use. Uh, if you run into another problem that I haven't listed in the workshop, please submit a pull request so that uh, in the future, others who might go through this content um, can, can have a potential solution. 
But I will say, uh, you know, to our moderator, Lalit, if it seems like tons of people are all encountering a problem and I'm just blasting by it, um, I'm, I'm happy to, to hear about that. So please, please go ahead and let me know in that case. Um, yeah, so what we're doing is we're going to be working through the workshop steps here. Um, hopefully you've completed the prerequisites before tuning into this workshop. Uh, and I just today added a, a version list uh, in case you have any issues. Um, you can compare the version of uh, platforms and various things that you have against what I used to develop this workshop. Um, oftentimes, just switching to correct to, uh, to match versions might uh, resolve certain problems. I did develop it on Mac OS. Um, for all I know, it should work totally fine uh, on Windows because uh, we're going to ultimately be running our game on an Android device or emulator. Um, so I can't think of any reason that any of this wouldn't work on Windows, but I, uh, you know, wasn't able to test it myself on that platform. So if you run into any issues and figure out how to resolve them, again, please feel free to open a pull request to this workshop repository. Okay, so I'll let you um, continue to follow along there. And let's get started. So the first thing we want to do is get our game building. To do that, we open up the Unity Hub. Um, this is the kind of Unity launcher app that lets you download various Unity things. And then we're going to create a new project. Click new project. And there's a bunch of templates um, that you can choose from. I'm going to, uh, which is the, oh yeah. If you scroll down a little bit or search, there's one called 2D Platformer Micro Game. That's the uh, template we're going to use. So we'll say download template. Um, I suppose I should have put this as part of the prerequisites because it might take some time. I, I had downloaded this already, so hopefully it will just get it from the cache. And you know, you can give this uh, any name that you want. Um, I'm recommending that you call it Appium Workshop, like this. Um, I've already got one with the same name because that is where I, uh, how I used to develop it. I'm just going to drop this one on my desktop. So I know it's the one that I'm developing while I'm live uh, here with you all. And so I'll go ahead and create that project. While that's being created, um, I should also say back to this Unity plugin workshop repo that I showed you. Um, we'll have specific instructions on how to do this later, but it, we're going to want to get the code from this. This is where our test code is going to come from. Uh, you can kind of follow along with me and write it from scratch, but there are some configuration files and boilerplate that all come from this repo. So you, you can clone it from GitHub using whatever kind of standard cloning, Git cloning method you like. So it'd be good to put this on your machine somewhere where you're going to be able to run uh, the test scripts from. OK. Let's go back and see how our um, thing is doing here. OK, so once the uh, project is being created, it looks like um, it takes a while for it to build and then open up in the Unity editor. Um, and yeah, just be warned, building Unity can take a while. Um, I have a brand new, um, you know, M1 based Mac Power yeah, MacBook Pro, and uh, it even takes a while for me. But not, so I imagine it might take a lot longer if you don't have a super speedy processor. Okay, so uh, what happens when the game is loaded is we get dropped into the Unity editor. Um, just close out any like this tutorial stuff. We don't really need that. Um, I'm not going to really teach you anything about how to make Unity games because I don't really know anything about that other than what I've had to learn by just kind of bouncing around in here. Um, but basically, if you click the kind of the game tab here, you can see kind of what how the game looks when it when it starts. Uh, over on the left hand side, there's a bunch of um, game objects. So you can see we've got a player object. And uh, not sure why I'm not seeing it. Oh, 
there. Have in there's a the, the scene um, tab here is where you can see your like this is the entire game level, and uh, here is our kind of start area with a camera. There's our player that I've got selected behind the camera there as it, the player like starts and drops down. None of this is particularly relevant to what we're going to be doing. We'll make a few changes to this game in a minute. Um, so now just to make sure that it's working, what I recommend is just hitting this, going to the game tab and like hitting the play button. That will actually compile the game. And if you're like me, uh, you now have some really annoying game music playing in your headphones, um, which I would love to figure out how to turn off, but there it is. You can actually play the game. So I'm using the arrow keys and the space bar to just kind of like jump. And um, you know, if I run into an enemy, I'll die and go back to the beginning uh, and so on. So um, again, the purpose of this isn't really to play the game. So we can hit stop there. And I um, wonder if there is an easy way for me to get rid of that audio. Well, I'm not going to worry about it. I'll probably break something else. OK. I guess you stop by hitting the play button again, not the pause button. So yeah, we'll, we'll all learn Unity together here. OK, so that this is the game just running on whatever our you know desktop or laptop operating system is. But we want to actually get it running on Android, because that's what we're going to be using with, uh, with Appium. Um, so first thing we want to do is make sure we have an Android device or an emulator connected. Um, I've got this emulator connected. Actually, it has, uh, uh, has the game on it already. So I'm going to stop it. all those things from running. I've turned my emulator sideways, because this game, I find, runs a lot better in landscape. So I've already turned mine sideways. You can you know, do whatever you want with yours. Um, but I recommend running it in landscape mode as well. Um, this is a, I think it's an API level 29 emulator, um, but it should, it shouldn't really matter what version of Android you're running as long as the game can compile and run on it. Um, okay. So we've got our, our emulator or device connected. A real device should also work just fine. Um, so what we want to do to get this building for Android is first go to file. And then build settings is where we figure out what can be built with this particular particular game. Uh, it's taken a while. There we go. That will just happen the first time. So here's where we can decide what platform we want to run on. So let's click on Android in the left-hand side. Um, if you don't have Android here, you uh, may need to actually install it as part of your Unity, um, your Unity Hub installation. I, I selected Android when I downloaded the IDE to make sure that it was an available platform. So right now, our selected platform is PC, Mac, and Linux standalone. So we want to switch it over to Android. Um, and if you want, you can change the run device um, to be something that's connected here. Um, it might try and connect devices via ADB or something like that. So I've got my emulator. It doesn't really matter unless you want to like build it and run it from Unity itself, uh, which we're not going to do. We're going to launch it with Appium. Um, so it's, it's not particularly relevant, but that's how you do that when you want to have a kind of development loop uh, on a particular device. And then I also think it's a good idea to check development build, um, because this is the kind of build that Appium expects to be using for its automation, you know, your, your debug APK for Android. Um, so I think that's one of the things that make sure we build that kind of version of the APK. And then let's click Switch Platform. That tells Unity, all right, we're going to be 
defaulting to Android when we're doing our builds now instead of um, our kind of desktop OS. Checking in on time. Ah, we're running a little behind. I think we'll be fine. So again, this can be a kind of involved process. Um, I think things, you know, it just has to generate different types of code scripts and assets and things like that for Android than for Mac OS, obviously. Okay, so we have switched our platform. And now just to make sure that it, uh, it works, it's a good idea to say uh, build and run. Um, and do, 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 do. we can give it any, we can call it anything we want. You know, we can call it Appium workshop.apk here in our Appium workshop directory. And then it will go through the process of building here. Aha. So this is um, an issue that uh, we will likely run into. Depends on your architecture, but it's saying basically that my emulator is not supported. Um, I'm trying to install like an ARM D7 APK to an ARM64 device. So here's what we need to do if you run into this issue of no compatible Android device found. Uh, we need to click on player settings. And then there's uh, under, yep. Yeah, so this is the, the basic project settings window, the player settings of the project. Um, we want to go into other settings. So it's already expanded here for me open up other settings and scroll all the way down to scripting backend. And we want the scripting backend to change from mono to IL to CPP. Don't ask me why. Uh, this is just what I had to do to make it work. And then we want to um, change our target architecture to also include uh, ARM64. Or uh, you know you might need to also include x86 if you're running on an x86 like Haxam enabled um, emulator. So you could theoretically just probably include all of these. I don't know if that increases the time or the size of the APK. Um, so I'm just going to leave selected the one that I know will work for my environment. But you may need to check one or more um, depending on the environments that you are testing on. OK, I'll close out this settings window. And I'll try my build and run again. And uh, oh, no Android device is connected. Make sure your device is plugged in. Maybe the devices. Looks like it's connected. OK. That works. Not sure why I had to uh, re-trigger ADB for it to find the device there. But um, technology, hey? This is the boring part of the workshop. I should have prepared something entertaining to do. Doubt that I can play some fun music for you all, but there's uh, Lolly. While I'm waiting for this, are there any like questions that have popped up that I can just kind of talk about? Sorry, it takes a bit while to uh, bring me back on stage myself. Yes, there are some questions. If you would like to answer. Uh, what is Unity game? It's a game, I believe. 
the what's award. a what's a Unity game? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, Unity is a is a game development platform. So um, it's a it's a toolkit and IDE that you use to develop games. It's what we're what we're using now. So maybe that question uh, came in a while back before I, I explained Could be, uh, yeah. what those things were. So uh, next question is what if game is developed using platform other than Unity? APM 2.0, will it support those game automation or not? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, I mean, at least not with this plugin. This plugin is designed to specifically work with um, the alt Unity tester that's designed specifically to work with Unity. So if there are other game platforms out there, um, it sounds like it might be possible to do something like what we're doing with this, but it would just involve, it would require somebody who really knows uh, development on that platform to build in the, the necessary hooks. Um, and then, you know, if that's you, let me know and I'd be happy to write an Appium plugin for it. But uh, that is not possible with this um, particular set of technologies. Cool. Another question: In game testing, uh, is it also related to person's ability to play games? So, how we can automate cases related to user speed or user logic and all? So, all in all, do you have to be a video game player to be a good tester or a good automator <laughs> for game testing? Yeah, I mean that's a good question. I suppose if you really want to test a game well, you should understand uh, how it's meant to be played uh, and what kinds of edge cases are important to consider. Um, I mean, I think it's just the same with, with any kind of thing that you're trying to test. Mm -hmm. If you don't understand the domain you're trying to test, you're not going to test it well. So that would also be true of games. But of course, that doesn't mean that if you have no experience that you're going to be bad at it. It means you just have to do, you might have to learn. You might have to play the game for a bit. Um, okay, cool. Well, uh, uh, thanks. Uh -huh. Let's pause there for a sec. Sure. Um, while I get this going. Okay, so that, that game has been built. And so then, you know, what we can do to uh, install it is I'll increase the size of my terminal window here. From, uh, from somewhere on, in your terminal, um, you can just say adb install dash r desktop appium workshop. I think this is where I put it. Um, and then you can just try and install it on the device. And you can open up your device. Uh, I've actually got a couple there, so I'm not sure which one is which. I'm just going to make sure that I'm using the exact one we just built by uninstalling them and making sure I'm installing the correct one here. Yeah, so you'll see this uh, new, I'm looking at it sideways. You'll see this new app here. And when it launches, there it is doing its thing. And blessedly, when I look at it in my Android emulator, I'm not hearing the really annoying music. So, but I can play it using my um, keyboard and, and all that, just the same as I could. So hopefully, you know, you've been able to build the game or in the process of doing that and then, you know, install it onto your uh, emulator or device and make sure that it works. So this is all nothing to do with Appium or testing yet. This is just getting a game uh, that we can build and that we can put onto our device and use it well. I'm going to increase the size here because I know that you're all looking at this screen as well. All right. Um, if you round, you might have run into another error. I ran into this error the first time I tried to build my application. There's an error that I got um, that told me that the JDK wasn't found. Um, if you got this error, take a look at the the plugin workshop README. Um, there's a set of steps you can take. It basically means that you just need to um, install the Java components for your IDE so it can find them or correctly link to a Java development kit or an Android SDK tools directory somewhere outside of your IDE. That's all just kind of configuration stuff uh, that might take some tweaking for your particular system. Um, but if that's where you're at right now, don't be discouraged. You'll um, definitely be able to resolve that because Unity will 
bundle the Android SDK and Java and all of that for you. Um, and that's what we're actually using to build these things. OK, cool. So now let's add Alt Unity Tester to uh, this project so that we can actually have it instrumented well. So what we want to do to add Alt Unity Tester is first go to the Asset Store. So that's in Window Asset Store. And you get this message, oh, the Asset Store has moved. Aha. OK, so then um, if you hit Search Online, it'll take you to the um, Asset Store online. You'll be prompted to log in if you're not already. I'm logged into my Unity account. Um, and then you can search for assets. So the first asset we want is Alt Unity Tester. Um, and you can see that there's one response here. So if you click on that, you can see that um, you'll either be able to add it or open it in Unity. I, mine says open in Unity because I've already added it to my account. So go ahead and um, add it. And uh, if you click the link here, it should open up something called the package manager in the Unity IDE itself. And you know, as long as you're logged in, it will show you packages that you have added to your account. Uh, make sure that you have the latest version. It should be 1.7.0. If you somehow had an earlier version, make sure it's updated to this one. Um, later versions will work, but the Appium plugin requires at least this version of Alt Unity Tester. So before we add this to our project, let's do one more thing. We've got to go back to the store and add one more asset. Uh, what we want to do is add json.net for Unity. Um, it's this one here, json.net for Unity made by Parent Element LLC. I'm not exactly sure why we need this. Um, it's a set of libraries that the Alt Unity tester appears to require that for some reason aren't included or don't work. Um, so I just I had to add this package in order for Alt Unity tester to compile within the game. So again, add it to your account, open it in uh, the Unity Package Manager. And now we've got both of these things here. Um, you might need to download them if they're not already downloaded. So make sure that they're both actually downloaded. And then what we want to do uh, is first of all, select our JSON.NET for Unity package and click import. And this shows us all the things that it's, all the files that it's going to add to our project. And with them, all of them selected, we hit import. Um, if you get some kind of warning about package manager dependencies, uh, it's fine to just click install slash upgrade. I had to do that in the previous uh, run, potentially because my environment wasn't clean. Um, OK, so that has added the JSON.NET for Unity package. Let's click back to my scene. I can now see that in my assets uh, list here, my setup app asset folders, I now have json.net as an asset. That's been added by the package manager. And then we're going to do the same thing with Alt Unity Tester. So just click import there. Oh, yeah, see this one. The Unity package has package manager dependencies. Um, that's because it comes uh, with some other dependencies that it needs that are kind of hidden to us. So again, it'll show us everything it's going to do to our project. We want to make sure that all of them are selected, and then we can hit import. And um, at this point, it will actually kind of try and re rebuild the project, I think, um, with the assets included. If something didn't go right, you'll get an error, um, which is how I found out I needed to add this JSON.NET for Unity package. But uh, once I have them both and I've added them in that order, things seem to work pretty well. So um, now we want to build an instrumented version of our app. So you'll notice that when we've added the Alt Unity Tester asset, we get a new window or a new menu up here called Alt Unity Tools. Um, 
And what we want to do is open up this thing called the Alt Unity Tester Editor. It basically lets us set up the configuration uh, for this. Um, it's advertising something called the Inspector. Um, I believe that's one of the, the paid tools that Altum has developed on top of this. Uh, feel free to check that out. I'm sure it's awesome. I haven't um, used it myself. Anyway, so we get this uh, kind of window here of you know things we can do. It actually seems like it lets you write tests in your Unity game, probably in C Sharp, and they might show up here, and we're not going to use any of that functionality. We're just going to use this to build an instrumented version of our game APK. So first thing we want to do is change our platform to Android so that it'll pick up the Android build settings that we have. And let's uh, set a build location. Um, and I'm just going to keep the same um, location as I, I put my uh, game earlier, the Appium Workshop directory. And um, let's see. We, at this point, can click on build only. And it should build a version of our um, game that includes the, the Alt Unity server. Now, the first time I tried to do this, I got an error um, that ultimately had to do with permissions on my um, laptop file system around the Android SDK. So we'll see if that happens again. If that does happen to you, uh, I have a set of instructions in the uh, readme that tells you how to change the, the ownership of certain files to make sure that you can access them. So we'll see if I have to, uh, have to do this here or not. And I'm going through all this detail and showing you how to add this stuff into your game because, um, you know, you might ultimately have a, a developer at your company doing this and then just giving you the instrumented APK. Um, but it's always good to know how to do this yourself because the developer may not know anything about Alt Unity Tester. They may not want to know anything about it. You may have to be the one to integrate it. Um, and it's just kind of, I think, wise to know how to use the development tool chain for the platforms that you're testing on. Uh, it's just as a, as a way of empowering yourself to... Um, make changes and know how things work, but it does take a while. Maybe we have time for another question, Lolly, if, uh, if you want to keep going. Yes, let's do that. <clears throat> Most of the questions were answered, but let's go. Is APM supported for every operating system platform or only for Windows? Um, so there's two ways to answer the question. Uh, one is to say that um, there is a, a, a definition of where you can run Appium, and Appium runs on Mac, Windows, and Linux. And then there's a question of which platforms does Appium support for automation? And that's a different question. And that's just, well, which Appium drivers exist out there? There are Appium drivers for iOS, for Android, for Mac OS, for Windows, uh, that one's actually made by Microsoft, although it hasn't been updated very much. Um, I've developed a Appium driver for Roku devices. There's one for Tizen um, TVs. Uh, so there are all kinds of things you can use Appium to automate. But yeah, you can you can run your Appium scripts uh, on Android, uh, sorry, Windows, uh, Linux, and Mac OS, and the Appium server runs there as well. Okay. I got my APK built, so I didn't run into this permissions error. But if you did, uh, then follow the steps in the uh, readme that I put there. OK, so what we want to do now is um, just kind of run this APK on our Android device. So I'm just going to rerun my ADD install command. Because I've run it with dash r, it will replace existing versions uh, of it. So I'll open this up. And this time, when the game launches, you can see we now have this nice green window that lets us know very clearly we are in a test version of this game that Alt Unity Tester has been added to. 
and it's waiting for a connection on port 13,000. Um, so you always want to take note of this port because we'll need it to start an Appium session um, on this Unity game. And you can adjust the port if for whatever reason it's uh, not working out for you. You can adjust it in the Alt Unity Tester editor window. Okay, so uh, the app is now properly instrumented um, for testing, but before we test the application, let's do something um, that will be useful for later on, which is to add some IDs to our objects so that we can um, potentially find objects by IDs. This is a way of adding essentially test IDs to objects that might not already have them. So let's, for example, look at our player object. Um, here are all the different components, a transform component, a player controller component, a sprite renderer component, and so on. Um, and so essentially what we want to do is add a new component to this object. In fact, we want to add a component to all of our objects. So to do that, we go up to Alt Unity Tools and go to Alt ID. And we can just say, uh, add Alt ID to every object in Active Scene. You could add alt ID to every object. I tried that before and it for some reason didn't work, but it worked to add it to every object in the active scene. Uh, I think we only have one scene in this game anyway. So once I've done this, if I now scroll down uh, to the bottom of my component list, I see that there's now an alt unity ID component and it has a, a randomly generated alt ID. Um, so let's actually just change this to something that's not randomly generated, let's call our player like super player or something like that. So now uh, this particular object, um, the player object has a specific ID. Um, so you can save the project and then go up to Alt Unity Tester Editor and again, click uh, build only and that will build a new version of the game where the player has been given us our special test ID. So this is a way that you can actually go into the game and give various objects uh, certain IDs as well. Okay, now while that's building, let's go ahead and configure the Appium plugin. First thing we want to do is uh, install it. I'm gonna go over here to a different window where I'm gonna be running my Appium server. Um, and actually I should probably I think I already have the plugin installed, so I'm not going to be able to demonstrate installing it. The way we install it is we run Appium plugin install dash dash source equals npm, and then the name of the plugin on npm where it's published is called Appium Alt Unity plugin. And uh, Appium will go and um, Install that. While that's happening, I'm just going to reinstall the version of the game that now has the super player custom ID that we added. And we go back over here and we can see that Appium has installed the Alt Unity plugin. Now let's go ahead and run our Appium server. Uh, we need to pass in a special flag called use plugins and make sure that we include Alt Unity in that list. That's the name of the plugin. Um, if we don't actually include it in the use plugins directive, then uh, it will not be active. And of course, we want it to be active. Now uh, we want to um, actually make sure that our system can talk to the Alt Unity server that's running inside of the game. So if you recall, uh, when we launched the game, it says that it's running on port 13,000. That's on the device. Right, so, so if this were an iOS simulator, it would be running on our system port as well, but because this is an Android emulator with its own local network, it's running on port 13,000 of the emulator, not of our system. So the, the easiest way to enable your system to access that port is to forward the port using ADB. Um, so that what we do, if we wanna forward it just to the exact same port on our local system, we can just forward from port 13,000 to port 13,000 uh, using the TCP um, protocol or space or whatever. So once that's done, um, theoretically, we now have access to uh, 
I keep clicking that instead of the emulator to the alt unity tester server. Uh, if you have Telnet on your machine, you can always just Telnet to that port. And if it says connected, that means you've connected. So that is pretty cool. All right, make sure your port's forwarded. And now we need to actually um, set up our script, right? So I'll go ahead and, and do this uh, with you. I'll go to my desktop and I'll clone um, get at github.com jlip slash unity plugin workshop.git. So I'll go into that directory. Great. And now the first thing we want to do while inside this directory, because it's a Node.js project, uh, is run npm install. This workshop, I chose to use Node.js for the test language, uh, just because it's familiar for me. Um, but you can use any Appium compatible language to, to write your uh, test with this plugin. Um, so if you're more familiar with Java or Python or something else, that's fine. You can just follow along with this workshop. And then you can kind of convert the, uh, the WebDriver IO client API into whatever client API it is you're familiar with. Um, it's usually pretty straightforward if you're familiar with those or you can reference the documentation. Okay, once we've gotten our test project dependencies installed, uh, we need to um, first tell our, our test suite where our app is that we're gonna want it to install. But just to see what it's like when we don't do that, um, what we can do is we can run um, npx mocha dot slash test slash empty. So this empty test, uh, I'll show it to you in a second, is basically just uh, a start and stop session. It just makes sure that we can actually connect to the alt unity server and that's it. Um, but if I run this now, it's gonna give me an error. The error that it gives me is I have to set the unity app environment variable with the path to the demo game. So that's just because I don't know in this file where the game is on your system. So we need to actually specify that. Uh, so let's make it, you have to export the Unity app variable. You know, if you're on Windows, you're gonna have to do whatever you normally do on Windows to set environment variables. Uh, I'm not exactly sure exactly how that um, works. So I'm gonna set it to the path to my APK that I'm working with. So if I echo it out, this is the appropriate APK, the one that I'm building for this live workshop. So now if I try and rerun my test script, first of all, I make sure I've got my Appium server up and running, uh, make sure I've got my emulator up and running, and the game doesn't need to be running, but Appium uh, will, should hopefully kill it and then relaunch it. So let's try this again npx mocha dot slash test slash empty date empty dot js this just runs mocha which is the test runner that i've chosen to use and now i can go back to my appium server see that it's doing a bunch of stuff and the game is launching and the app shut down and if i go back to my test runner we can see that it passed so now let's actually take a look at what this empty.js file is. Um, it's basically just a, a test suite. We've got our Unity game that we're describing some tests for. In the before block, we are starting a new WebDriver IO session, a new Appium session using certain parameters. And our test is empty, it's not doing anything. And then when we're done, we're quitting the session. Uh, just to see what kind of parameters we're including, uh, we basically have parameters for the WebDriver IO client for specific to that client that's saying where the Appium uh, server is running. So it's on localhost 4723, like normal. And then we're passing in a set of capabilities. So these capabilities are standard Appium capabilities, except for the alt unity host and alt unity port. These are new capabilities that um, we have to include. Right, because we need the Appium Alt Unity plugin to know where uh, to talk to the Alt Unity 
test your server that's running. And in our case, we've forwarded port 13,000 to our own local host, so that's where we're directing it. But if you've got a device connected somewhere else, you might need to adjust these. Either way, um, these are required. Cool. Um, all right, so that is our empty test. Uh, if you, for some reason, got an error when you were trying to run the empty test suite, um, excuse me, you might want to be sure that you forwarded your port correctly. Um, you might want to make sure that you use the application with the alt unity server that was instrumented. So the one that has the little green uh, message pop up. And you want to make sure that when you started um, the Appium server process, you used the dash dash use plugins flag to specifically opt into using the plugin. So those are some common errors uh, that might result um, from not doing those things. OK. Um, <clears throat> let's see how we're doing time-wise. We, we need to move on pretty quickly here. Um, there's a lot, lot more that I want to cover. But I need to take a drink of water. So um, Lali, is there, is there maybe one more question that I can answer along the way? Uh, yes, maybe you may want to answer, will there be some changes or upgrade for Appium Grid using Selenium Grid cause lots of issues within driver and he's getting his test freeze mostly. Probably his tests are getting frozen perhaps. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that doesn't have anything to do with this workshop, but um, what I can say about that is that um, uh, Appium hasn't made any changes. Appium doesn't maintain support for grid. Um, so it's, if something has changed in grid, then something you know, needs to be fixed somewhere else. Uh, I know that it is supposed to work. Uh, Appium 2 and Selenium Grid 4 do work together. Somebody has given like, talks about this. Um, I haven't tried to make it work myself, so I'm not sure exactly what the problem would be. I know Diego, I think Diego Rivera from the Selenium Project has uh, written up some things on, on how to make it work. So that might be a place to check. Uh, do you know what kind of issues one can face using this plugin? Oh, uh, I mean, well, we'll probably encounter some as we go along. Otherwise, no, because uh, everything that I've tried works. <laughs> it's <laughs> the, the, thing, the things that I haven't tried that you'll probably run into issues with. Um, and that's, where this is such a new plugin, um, it hasn't received a lot of use yet. Uh, I literally have just been finishing finishing it this week. So it's brand new. Um, I assume that when lots of people start using it for their own games, that we'll uncover all kinds of issues. But I don't know uh, what they are yet. So we'll have to figure that out together. All right. I will stay on stage. Just I will mute and uh, Perfect. turn on my video so I can. Perfect. OK, so um, first thing we need to do to actually uh, do something uh, with the Unity game rather than just working with uh, the Android data version of the app is enter into the Unity context. So um, let's do that now. Basically, what we can do is we can create a new file called context.js, or you can just open it up from the repo. I was going to type things in live, but it's just I think we're going to run out of time if I do that. So I'll just open up the file called context.js. It's exactly the same as empty.js, except for um, I've added something into the test definition here. Uh, there's two commands. The first is driver.switchContext, and we're switching into the Unity context. And then we're writing something out to the console. And what are we writing out to the console? Well, the page source. The reason we're going to write out the page source is because I want us to see how when we're in the Unity context, certain Appium commands work differently than when we're not in the Unity context. So let's go ahead and run the context.js uh, test. Um, again, the way we run tests in this project is we say npx mocha, and then um, we can specify the specific test file we want to run. We could run all of them, but for now, we're just going to run uh, context.js. So run that. Um, and again, if I actually watch the test run, all I'm going to see is 
the app open and then shut down again because we're not making it do anything. But you can see that we did get a lot of output here. Um, so this is pretty hard to read on my screen. Um, there is a this is basically the same output is referenced in the plugin documentation. So if you go to the documentation of the plugin and look for the get page source command, there's an example XML source file. This is a little nicer to see. You can see that the root element in our source is, is Unity, not the uh, Android um, app or whatever it is. And we don't have any like android.widget.text field or anything like that. We have instead all of the actual objects from our Unity game. So for example, we have an enemies um, hierarchy here that actually maps directly to the, where is it? The, uh, the enemies objects in our scene. And we've got patrol paths underneath and enemy underneath. And this is exactly what we see here. Um, so this by itself contains a lot of really interesting information, like um, you know where these things are on the screen, where these things are on the world. So for example, we've got X, Y, and Z, which are kind of like screen coordinates. And we've got world X, uh, world Y, and world Z, which are... Um, coordinates in the game's own coordinate system, whatever that is. So this, these are kind of like absolute coordinates within the game world, kind of like latitude and longitude. Uh, but then um, these other ones over here are like coordinates as you're looking through the particular camera that the game is being displayed through at the given moment. So anyway, there's, uh, there's lots of stuff there um, that you could dig into. But all that to say that the page source looks very different from normal Android source output. Um, and we can use this source output to generate some, or to at least figure out what certain locator strategy selectors should be. So we could construct um, XPath queries that look for particular elements within this hierarchy that I want to interact with. Like if I want to get some information about the player or um, you know, do anything like that. We can use XPath queries to find elements uh, and then do our normal Appium type things with them. So let's do that. Um, <clears throat> next, we're going to open up the elements.js test and um, do a few things. You can see that we've got our switch context statement right at the beginning of the test. Uh, you know, we could also I've kind of put this into our before method if we have multiple tests, because probably want all of the tests to run in the Unity context. Uh, where you put it is up to you. Now we're going to try and find an element. Uh, first, we're going to try and find an element by ID, because, uh, oh, actually, uh, this is the final state of this particular file. Um, let's first try and find an element by its XPath. So I've changed the super player ID to uh, an XPath query here, like we just talked about trying to find the player object. So I'm just using my typical, you know, WebDriver IO find element commands, just like I would normally find any element using Appium or Selenium. And I get back an element reference in my test script. So I'm finding the player and then using the same strategy, I'm finding the uh, 10th enemy in the list um, and then I'm making some assertions using the is displayed method. So the is displayed method basically um, looks at all this information. So let's look at the player, for example. Where is the player? Here's the player. It looks at um, its X and Y information and says, okay, uh, is this particular screen coordinate actually on the screen right now? And if so, it says, yes, it's displayed. And if not, it says, no, it's not displayed. So we're basically making an assertion that the player is on the screen and that the 10th enemy in the list is not on the screen, as we expect uh, an enemy that's you know, far away to not be on the screen. So this is just demonstrating how we can um, find elements and then interact with them just using all of the same um, Appium 
uh, strategies and commands that we're, we're used to. So let's go ahead and run this. This time I'm going to run elements.js. And again, we won't see anything because we're not doing anything yet, but that test did pass, so our assumptions were confirmed. So um, you might be asking yourself, okay, what, what locator strategies are available with this plugin? Um, that is in the plugin documentation under find elements. You can see that it supports six locator strategies. Um, I won't go into all the details here, um, but you should be familiar with, with what they are. Um, let's move on to trying to find an object by its ID, specifically by the special alt ID that we added on the player in our IDE here. So remember when we were down here and we called this the super player in terms of the alt ID? Well, if we go to our test script and instead of finding by X path, if we find by ID, uh, this is just how you do that in WebDriver IO and rerun the test. Oops, it's not player, it's super player is the ID. We then rerun the test. We should see it uh, also pass. And it did. That means that we successfully added our own test ID on that particular game object, and we were able to get a handle uh, on that object via its element. So um, there's a bunch of different element commands that are available, not just is displayed. Um, again, these are in the documentation, um, which I think it's a really good idea for you to take a look at. If you just go to the all Unity plugin reference documentation that I wrote, you can see under element interaction, there's a lot of different uh, commands that you have access to. Depending on the type of element that you're dealing with, not all of these commands make sense, for example, if I tried to run get text on the player object, it would throw an error because the player object doesn't have any text. It's not that kind of kind of thing. OK, um, let's move now on to actually doing something in our test. Um, one of the most important things, at least for this game, that I realized we needed to do is to actually control uh, the character, actually move the, the player object around, right? Um, and to do that, we need to emulate key button presses and be able to uh, press the, the left and right arrows or things like that. So um, we can do that using the Appium Actions API, which has full support for expressing any kind of actions you can take with a keyboard or whatever. So let's, um, what we want to try and do first is open up the uh, escape menu, the, um, the pause game menu. I can't actually do it manually on my Android emulator because it, uh, for some reason, doesn't send the escape key into the emulator. But we'll see how it actually works through automation anyway. So it doesn't really matter. To do that, let's open up actions.js. So now we've changed our test to say that it should navigate to the settings menu. So first of all, we make sure we're in our Unity context. And then we define an action. And each Appium client, as you probably already know, has a different way of defining actions. If you're in Python, you use uh, Action Builder. If you're in Java, there's another builder that you use. Uh, with WebDriver IO, you basically just create um, the raw protocol um, JSON as a JavaScript object. So for me, I've defined pressing the escape button as this object where I specify that the type of action we're dealing with is a key. Uh, every action you know, sequence has to have its own ID, like the source ID of you know, where are these keys coming from. Uh, and then we have our actual action sequence itself. The first thing we do when we press the escape key is we push the key down. And the next thing we do is we wait for a certain number of milliseconds, in this case, 750. And then we allow the key to come back up. Um, and in both cases, we're using a value of escape, because that is the key that we want to 
um, press. And you might be asking, okay, um, that's not like the Unicode character for the escape key. Um, what's going on? And uh, the, the fact is that we're not using the kind of standard way of specifying key values because we're not dealing with a standard web browser or anything like that. We're dealing with Unity. And um, to find out what values you should use, you can go to, again, the plugin documentation, click on key actions, and then it has a link to something called the alt key code enumeration. And here it's just the uh, enumeration, the enum object in uh, alt unity tester that maps keys to particular constants that it uses for internal purposes. So we have access to a lot more types of keys than you normally would on a keyboard, um, including like various kinds of buttons and arrows and joystick buttons and things like this. So if you're trying to figure out what to press, you know, first of all, you got to figure out what your game responds to, right? Does it respond to joystick buttons or keys or whatnot? In our case, we can open up the menu by hitting the escape key. And so I just use the string version of this enum key here, which is escape. You can also uh, use the number if you want, but um, escape is a little more readable than the number 27. So that's why we're using escape as the value here. And then we just call perform actions. Um, on that, that brings up our uh, escape menu. And now what we want to do is we actually want to uh, walk through the menu a little bit and make some assertions on what's going on with the menu. So um, I can show you the menu in the Unity editor over here. It's under UI Canvas. And uh, where is it? How do, I, how do I get this to show up somehow? Uh, there was like a, well, I guess I'll just have to show you in the, um, when I actually loads up in the game, there was, there was a way that I found to get it to show up here. Um, but I am clearly not good enough at Unity stuff to remember that. Okay, well, I'll just show you when it, when it pops up. Basically, it's a, a menu system with a couple different um, sub-menus that have text and things in them. So we're going to find some of that um, particular text. Yeah, I do wish I could show you. Anyhow, there it is in that general area, invisible. Uh, okay, so what are we going to do within this menu? First of all, we're going to look to see uh, what text buttons exist. So there are button elements that have text elements inside them. And basically what we want to do is get the text of each of uh, the buttons. And if the, but if the text is what we expect, we want to click the button. We have to do it in a little bit of a weird way because um, the buttons themselves don't have text properties. It's the text elements underneath the buttons that have text properties. And we can't easily um, click the text elements and we can't easily get text from the buttons. So what we do is we basically look for all the text elements underneath all the buttons, figure out which one is the one we want, and then click the, uh, the corresponding buttons. Uh, so basically this just says uh, we want to click on the settings menu once the, uh, the pause window has opened up. And then we want to get the header of that particular settings menu and expect that it's, or assert, I should say, we want to assert that its header object has the text settings. So basically, what we're trying to do in this test is open up uh, the game pause menu, navigate to the settings menu, assert that that navigation was successful, and then close the, the game pause menu again. So that's what we're doing here. So let's go ahead and run this particular test, okay, test slash actions.js. And we should be watching this because we just missed it. Run it one more time, went pretty fast. So all we're gonna see is the uh, 
main menu pop up, quickly switching to the settings menu. And then the test is over. So that's how you um, basically get the text of, of particular elements and click particular elements. Um, these are very useful things. Of course, not everything has text property. So um, you have to kind of know from your game which things actually have the text component attached to them. Um, but once you have figured that out, it's pretty straightforward to then interact with those elements. OK, we've just got a short amount of time. So let's do one more thing to kind of show actually playing the game a little bit. Um, we've got this all in game.js. Basically, what we're doing is we're wanting to show that we can run, jump, and stomp on an enemy, and that when we stomp on that enemy, it's no longer around. So this is an actual functional test of the game. Is the game behaving the way it's designed to? So here's how uh, I've decided to do this. So first of all, we go into our Unity context. Then uh, we're finding the enemy, the enemy that we're going to stomp on. And this particular enemy is the one whose position in the world um, is at this particular value. So by looking at the, um, the page source, I was able to determine, OK, the first enemy we're going to encounter, the one we're going to try and stomp on, is the enemy at this place in the world. If, if I'd wanted, you know, if I were really doing this for a job or something, I would have given that enemy an ID so that I could just find it by ID. But instead, I found it using this XPath query. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm asking, OK, where is its Y position in the world currently? Um, because the way this game works is that when you stomp on an enemy, the enemy object doesn't like disappear. It just falls down to the bottom of the world. It falls down like very far. And that's how you kind of determine in this game that that enemy has been stomped on. It's when it falls all the way down, right? Like um, when we actually play the game, you can see this happening where if I jump on an enemy, so we do it, it just falls down. Um, so it just falls down below the view, but it doesn't actually disappear. That's how this particular game is developed for whatever reason. Um, so the way that I need to make assertions is based on the world Y value of this particular enemy. So I'm, I'm saying, OK, what is its initial world Y value? Because later we're going to make an assertion that it's gone way, way, way below that. Now we need to define our action sequence. This is the action sequence that I just did manually. First, we're pressing down the right arrow. We're holding it for 1.6 seconds. Without letting the right arrow up, we add the space bar to jump while we're moving. We only hold down the space bar for about half a second. Then we let go of the space bar, stop jumping. And then we wait a little bit longer, and then we let go of the right arrow. And then we just pause for effect here. We don't really need this last one, but I just want us to be able to see that everything actually happened uh, when the enemy falls down below the frame. So we basically perform that series of cue sequences. And then again, we find that same enemy. And then we check its worldwide position. And at last, we make an uh, assertion that the final worldwide position is less than the initial worldwide position, that it's, it's lower. Um, it's gone down uh, in worldwide position. And this is how the coordinates space works in uh, Unity, where uh, down is low. So that's how I decided to map out this particular test requirement. So let's run it and actually hopefully see something happen. Uh, so we're going to run test slash game dot JS. And let's watch it go. Here we are running and jumping and stomping. And the assertion passed. Uh, we got a green check mark here. So the final state of the enemy was indeed lower uh, than it was when it started. So um, that's basically the, you know, the hands-on portion of the workshop. We've looked at, uh, you know, how to get your game building in Unity. We've looked at how, how to add the alt Unity tester server to your game so that we can talk to. We've looked at how to install the Appium alt Unity plugin and how to write uh, scripts that you know, look at 
the object source of a game using the plugin and look at how to find elements, how to get text, how to click elements, and how to you know control a kind of keypad based game um, using that as well. Um, that's pretty much all there is to it. I'm going to throw up a few more slides to run that our workshop, and then we can uh, see if there's any questions. So in terms of your own next steps, if this stuff is interesting to you, definitely it seems like it would be a good idea to actually understand Unity, be, Unity a bit better. Um, just like it really helps if you're doing iOS or Android automation to understand how iOS and Android development works, uh, it also seems really helpful for doing Unity game automation to understand how Unity games themselves work. Uh, it's obviously very clear that I don't know very much myself. I've just had to learn a few things in order to develop this plugin. But obviously, if I end up uh, working on any more games, um, I'll learn a lot more about Unity along the way as well. Uh, the documentation for the plugin that I've referenced a few times is very important. There are some more advanced features that we didn't talk about here. Um, so, you know, read the documentation to kind of learn more about those because those might be essential for the type of game that you have. Uh, I would love for you to actually try your own games with this. So if you've got your own game that you're building with Unity, um, try writing some tests with this plugin and provide some feedback. I don't own uh, other Unity games, right? These are typically very proprietary. So I can't just pull, you know, the, the latest hot game from the mobile store and uh, work with it because it needs to have the alt Unity tester server built into it, which means you have to have the source code and all that. So for this plugin to really work for a lot of use cases, I would love for lots of different people to try and use it and to provide feedback and uh, to help you know, locate any bugs that might be there and establish you know, good defaults and best practices for various things. There is uh, there's a Discord server called Alt Unity Tools that the folks that, that make Alt Unity Tester hang out in, and I've been hanging out in there. Um, so if you're using Alt Unity Tester or the Alt Unity Tester Appia plugin that I made, that's probably a good place to hang out with other people who are trying to do similar things and might have some tips for you if you run into trouble. And then obviously, um, you know, if you get any support from the community, it's always nice to contribute back. Uh, you could help me develop the plugin. Um, you could help share your knowledge on that Discord or on various forums or whatever. And all this stuff is, is open source as well, so it's very uh, accessible to you. All right, thanks. Um, that's it from my end. And uh, I know we've just got a handful of minutes left, so would love to take some questions. Uh, yep, we have one uh, box of questions. So if you want, uh, you could also see it if you unshare your screen. Uh, there is a QA and a window. And you can decide on yourself. Great, yes, let me, which let me do one that. you would like to answer. OK, so I see I'll just go unanswered here. Great. OK, can we auto play? Can we auto, auto play? I'm very jet lag right now. Apologies. Um, can we automate role playing games and multiplayer games as our actions should be based on other players' enemies? I mean, sure. I mean, in general, the logic of uh, you know automating a game is just going to be so much more complex than the logic of automating. I don't know, even like a multiplayer UI experience, like a chat. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't do it. It just means you have to orchestrate it, right? Like. Uh, Again, to use the example of chat, you have two Appium drivers, one of which is controlling like one participant in a chat and one of which is controlling the other. That's a multiplayer experience. So you could also do that um, <clears throat> with games, right? You could have two, two Appium servers with plugins, uh, two different devices connected, both interacting with each other all in one test script so that you have a, a shared kind of global state and you can run uh, scenarios like that. So are, there are definitely going to be limitations, uh, you know, if it's like, if everything requires like microsecond or millisecond response times, like, I don't know how fast all Unity Tester is, um, but for this type of platformer game, it seemed to be pretty, pretty responsive. I could imagine that it would also potentially work for, uh, you know, first person shooters or things like that, as long as you could set up a pretty clean environment. 
Can All right. Start? Will the page source get changed as the player moves in the game? Yes. Um, it just it always checks the the existing state of all of the game objects. So objects might come and go. They might change their positions. Um, it's always a good idea to find an element right before you interact with it, because if you hold on to that element reference, none of its attributes will be updated. If you like wait several seconds and after you've moved something around on the screen, um, those will no longer reflect reality. So it's always a good idea to, to find and interact with an element kind of right at the same time. Okay, Appium 2.0 is developed using what all underneath wrapping tools? As we heard about WebDriver IO, Appium and Alt Unity. I'm not sure I understand the question. Appium itself is developed in Node.js. Um, Appium plugins all have to be JavaScript. Appium drivers all have to be JavaScript. But there's nothing to keep Appium plugins or drivers from um, relying on other sets of tools. For example, Appium itself doesn't um, provide any like low-level platform automation. When you automate an iOS app with Appium, you use the XUI test framework from Apple. That's not written in JavaScript. It's not owned by the Appium team. So our Appium iOS driver has to uh, you know, find a way of, of interfacing with that technology, which it does in a variety of complex ways. It's the same with this plugin. Um, and with any Appium script that you write, uh, you have to use a client library to interact with the Appium script. You have to choose, am I going to write my Appium tests in Python or uh, Java or JavaScript or whatever? Um, and then depending on the language you want to write it in, there might be one or more client libraries. Uh, currently for JavaScript, the Appium team recommends WebDriver IO. And so that's what I used, but you don't have to use that. So hopefully that provides a little bit of clarity on there. Um, someone says, I couldn't understand the driver dot dollar sign in the code. Um, if you were using driver, if you're using XPath, shouldn't it be driver dot find element? Uh, if I was, if I were using uh, Java, it would be. The driver dot dollar sign is a web driver IO specific convention. Um, it's just a convenience method for very quickly find, for very succinctly finding an element. Um, but in Java, you wouldn't use driver dot, driver dot dollar sign. You'd use driver dot find element. And in Python, you'd use driver dot find underscore element. That's what I said at the beginning. Like I'm using the web driver IO client library for this workshop because I have to pick one and I know it pretty well, but uh, you can pick something totally different. The plugin will work exactly the same. It's just, you'll have to, you know, use your own knowledge of the API of whatever language you're working in, whether that's Java or Python. And you'll have to convert the kind of things that we've done in this workshop to the appropriate commands for that language. OK. Um, <clears throat> if using Python or C-sharp findings, can we use Alt Unity Tester? I assume you mean directly. Uh, was this plugin created by you in order to make Unity game automation open for other bindings like Node and Java? Yes, uh, that is one reason. One reason is that um, if you want to use Alt Unity Tester today, you have to use Python or C-sharp. Um, another reason is that um, even if you are using, let's say, Python, you might not want to have to instantiate two completely different libraries with two completely different APIs and manage their interaction. Uh, or if you're new to this whole thing and you're familiar with Appium, it might feel more comfortable to just uh, learn how to do everything from the perspective of Appium rather than learning uh, an entirely new underlying technology. So it's kind of like, you know, couldn't you write your XCUI tests? Uh, your, couldn't you write your iOS tests just using XCUI tests directly? Yes, you could. Um, and if you already like writing in Swift, absolutely. Um, but one of the benefits of Appium is that it abstracts all the unique things about each of these APIs into something that's more universal and more global. And so it's just a little bit quicker to learn. Um, and the cost of that is, of course, that now you, you're kind of hiding the underlying technology, um, which sometimes means that it's a little bit harder to figure out um, when something goes wrong, where the problem actually is. So there's always trade-offs in this kind of thing, but that's one of the, the main kind of philosophical benefits of Appium. 
Okay, how do you achieve syncing, synchronizing here? For example, what point of time sh should the jump action be simulated? Uh, I guess the way I'm thinking uh, to answer this question is um, like, how did I know to put in certain time values for my jump, like 1600 milliseconds of the right button and then 500 milliseconds of the space bar? Like, how did I come up with those things? Uh, well, I just tried different numbers until it actually worked because, um, I mean, if I, let's say if I could have like a little stopwatch or something here, I could play the game and like hit it every time I pressed a, a, a key. I mean, it'd be cool to come up with some kind of key logger technology that just like you could play the game and it would uh, recognize exactly when you were doing all these keystrokes and then it could generate like the Appium actions uh, object from that. That'd be a pretty cool like um, partner technology to this. But for this simple example, I just uh, you know played with numbers until it was correct for this particular game. And so if I changed like the speed at which my player runs in this game, these numbers are going to be incorrect. So probably if you're doing this in a real project, you want to uh, you know parameterize these numbers by keying it to the game speed or who knows. Um, again, these are there are some good practices that are waiting to be uh, defined once we start applying this to a, a lot of different games. All right, considering the same game as the example that I used for the workshop, can we set accessibility IDs to enemies or player programmatically at runtime? Uh, I think there is a way from within the Unity um, game itself uh, to call out to the alt unity ID component and, you know, dynamically add that component to, um, to an object programmatically, but that's something you have to do in the game code. That's not something you would do, um, from the outside or is it, could we do it from the outside? Um, there might be a way to call, call methods from the outside, but it, it'd be much more straightforward to do it as part of your game development. All right, last one right now. Can we calculate the distance between player and the enemy in the runtime to perform the jump action? That's a good idea. Um, I did think about that. It re would require kind of a lot more, uh, you know, tricky logic. Um, but yeah, because because you have the world X and the world Y values, um, and because you know things like the speed the player runs at, you could theoretically, you know, run, you know, push, push down the right arrow, um, check the distance, pull the distance, like when the distance becomes this value, now you hit the space bar. Um, presumably that would, would work as well. Um, it might require some, some tweaking or fine tuning and depending on how uh, tight your, mar your error margins are in your game itself, um, it might not be enough, but uh, yeah, putting some more intelligence into it is uh probably a good idea. Cool, so probably that's all uh, we had. I have one question I'm just wondering, considering how niche and how specific this whole framework is or the plugin is, what is your opinion about its uh, exp somebody's expertise on this skill as a marketable skill or, you know, like if I'm to ask someone, okay, learn uh, this plugin and learn automation for this thing, what what would be my best case to convince the person or the tester to pick some interest in learning this? Well, I mean, game companies have a huge need for this kind of thing, more mm -hmm. than they even know. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. I've talked to so many people who are like, oh, I wish we could automate our game. I wish we could automate our game. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most people just aren't aware that it's possible. And I mean, to be honest, it hasn't really been possible for that long. So mm -hmm. I think companies should absolutely be like investing lots of resources into mm -hmm. giving their employees these kinds of skills. Mm -hmm. I also think that if you, if you just, if you learn the stuff on your own, you go to a company that, you know, has, has a requirement of testing a, a unity game and you say, Oh, I can, I can write a script to do this. Like you'll be a total hero. I mean, Cool, nobody cool. is nobody is doing this kind of thing. So, um, in terms of 
it, it's not like the kind of thing where you're going to find a lot of existing job mm -hmm, offer mm -hmm. like requirements for like must have you know alt unity tester game testing experience because it is pretty niche but it's the kind of thing which is so valuable it's just that people aren't doing it yet and so they don't know to ask for it yeah that's that's interesting or maybe just experiencing this could uh, give people more insights into how to build on top of this or like use this experience for doing something similar in other frameworks uh, i think that that's most likely uh, one useful aspect of it well, I think we don't have more questions. Uh, it was most certainly an interesting session, very new, very unique. Uh, as folks have commented, most of them saw automation for games for the first time. So thank you so much for putting efforts, uh, Jonathan, and thank you for sharing this with us. I'm sure people would have more questions once they try it, and I would like you uh, to talk with them. And people, feel free to reach out to Jonathan uh and let's make something big out of this uh with that i would say this has been the last session for the day uh see you tomorrow do not forget tomorrow we are starting at two o'clock india time and not the morning nine uh that's the very important update for uh the sessions tomorrow so thank you so much and see you tomorrow and have a great time till then bye All right bye everyone thanks